Good morning, everyone. Glad that you could be here for our Bible study in Sunday school this morning in an auditorium class. And this morning, we're going to be continuing our study in the book called The Walk. And it's a It's the second book of the discipleship series that we've been using in our church. Um, And so we're going through the content in this book called The Walk, and we're in chapter 8 this week. So if you happen to have your books, if you could please turn to page 117. And the title of our chapter for this week of study is called Financial Stewardship. Financial Stewardship. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And uh, of course, as we've talked about in the last few weeks, stewardship in the Bible means management with the idea that as a believer in Jesus Christ, we, we are managers, we are stewards of everything that God has given to us. What kinds of things have God, has God given to us? Well, he's given to us uh, finances, resources, and we have a responsibility to manage those according to biblical principles. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So there are, um, this is of course just an introduction to the uh, foundational principles for handling money God's way. We're not going to be able to cover everything today, but we're going to look at some biblical principles. So if you have your Bibles, uh, I'd like for you to uh, have them ready to look up some verses that we're going to talk about. The first will be in Psalm 119 and verse 104. Psalm 119, verse 104. So what's God's plan for your finances? That's what we're going to talk about today. Did you know, and this is what it says in the book on page 117, that the Bible contains more than 2,300 verses about money. Did you know that? And we're going to be reading all those verses today in Sunday school. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to be able to read all of them. But we're going to, we're going to read some of them just to kind of give us an idea of, of biblical principles that God has laid out for us with regard to finances. And um, Let's take a look at the first verse that we have here on the screen, Psalm 119 and and verse 105. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, as a child, when I was saved, I was saved when I was 10 years old, and I remember when I was young, somewhere in in those years, between 10 and 12, I remember... I learned this Bible verse. And I kind of had an idea. I I thought I knew what it meant. But it wasn't until just this week when I was studying this book, The Walk, there was was a statement in the chapter, and it it added more, uh, you might say, understanding to this verse. And what I came to uh, figure out from reading the chapter was, it says God's word is relevant to both our short-term plans and our long-term plans. I I had never realized that before. In the verse it says, the word is a lamp, a lamp unto my feet. Well, you know, if we're walking, we're going to take one step at a time. If you go outside in the dark and say you have a flashlight and you shine it down, you can see where your feet are going, like one step at a time. But then it also, the verse says, it's a light unto my path. So if, if my pathway was going this way, I could shine the light ahead a little ways and see where I'm going. And that's what the scripture is. It's a lamp unto our feet. It shows us each step the way that we should go, but it's also a light unto our path. It's both short-term and long-term. I thought that was interesting. And uh, as we talk about uh, the different concepts in the chapter today, I think that just that verse helps give it a little bit more understanding. So um, whoever wrote the book, thank you. (laughs) It's a combination of authors, I believe. Uh, A verse right before Psalm 119, verse 105, is Psalm 119, verse 104, and it says, Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. And what that's saying to me is that 
the way that we get understanding is through God's word. So if we, if we want to understand how to live a Christian life, we have to look to God's word. If we need to understand how to use our finances in a biblical way, look to God's word because it has biblical principles. By the way, <laughs> there's two gentlemen that are sitting in the auditorium today who are far more qualified to be speaking on this topic than myself. And Dr. McIntyre and Mr. Chuck Gunder, they are both uh, have life experience and education in finances, and they have superior knowledge in this. So if I say something wrong or you guys want to add something along the way, please jump in. Chuck, <laughs> come on up here. <laughs> okay, so they're going to keep me on my toes. Okay, another verse, a biblical principle that we want to look at is in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I don't even have to turn to this one. I know it by heart. You, do, you probably do too. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Remember in Psalm 119, 105 about the path, light the way? See, if we trust in the Lord, if we look to the Lord and look to his guidance and leadership, he's going to direct our way. When I, when I used to teach college students at Clearwater Christian, uh, I was an advisor to them as well. And so they'd come in and they'd, I'd have to work with them on their schedule for the next semester. Or, or sometimes they would just come in with a question. And some of the seniors would be saying, um, I'm going to be graduating and I'm not sure what to do you know, with my life. So I'd say, have you prayed about it? Have you asked God to, to show you what his will is for your life? Some of them would just say, hmm, I never thought about that. <laughs> to me, it was very obvious, you know, if you're a believer, look to the Lord, ask him, what do you want me to do with my life? Uh, but some people, I guess they don't think that way. But we should think that way in every aspect our, of our life, especially with regard to finances, because it's very important. And then there's another verse that I wanted to look at. If you have uh, your Bible, flip back to the Old Testament, Hosea. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. This one might be hard to find. You know, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. It's in, it's in that section that we don't usually go to very much. Uh, but oh, in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, the verse says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I'm just going to read that part. But uh, what that verse is saying is, and uh, Hosea was a prophet. He was talking to the children of Israel. He was saying, you're, you're destroyed because of lack of knowledge. In other words, you're not following God's word. And, and I think this is a good warning to us too. Um, if you want your life to be on track and, uh, and doing God's will, we have to look to his word and we have to follow what it says. You know, uh, God has given us biblical knowledge and principles to follow. We need to look to them and then see if they match up with what we're doing. So in this chapter, uh, it has some major headings that I think are really excellent. And there are f four biblical financial principles that are laid out in, in this particular chapter. And I want to use my little laser pointer and turn around and show you something. L let's look at the four areas. One, one is called ownership. And next to it, it says God's part. Why? Because God owns everything. <laughs> so the next one says control. Notice what it says, God's part. God's in control of everything. Everything. The next one, provision. Oh, look again. God's part. God provides us in every way. He provides for us. But then notice there's one point here. Faithful management. That's our part. So out of the four parts, we only have one little part, right? It's important. But notice that three of the areas are God's part. Ownership, control, 
provision, and then our, what's our part? Management. So we want to take a look at that today. God has the biggest part in our financial circumstances, but we also need to acknowledge him and manage our finances according to his will. Um, a few years ago, I was, uh, every Christmas, my family on my side uh, gets together on Christmas Eve. We worked it out this way, like I get together, we get together uh, with my family on Christmas Eve and then Lynn's family on Christmas Day. It makes things more easy to you know, handle all those activities. But anyway, um, my niece's son uh, said to me after a, uh, my brother asked me to pray for the food before we had our, you know, uh, all of our refreshments and everything. Uh, he, he said to me, he says, Gary, he says, you know, uh, I, I have a job. I, you know, I work, I earn money, I, I pay for my food. Why do I need to thank God for my food, for my meal? So I think my eyes got really big. <laughs> and I said, hey, you know, you better be really careful about the way you're thinking there. I said, that's not, it's not a good idea to think that way. I said, you need to thank God that you have a job, that you're healthy, that you can work, that you can earn money, that you can buy food or pay for your food. You need to thank him. You know, be thankful for all that. You know, instead of, you know, oh, I earned this money and why should I thank God? You know, he, had a, he didn't have any part, in other words, he didn't have any part of it. No, that's not the way to think. That's not the way to think. So we, we, need to, we need to acknowledge God's part in this big picture. So let's take a look at each one of these steps or principles. But before we do, on uh, page 119, I thought there were some good quotes here. At the top on the right, uh, it says, first one, one quote here, a key thought, decisions about earning, saving, spending, and investing are equally as spiritual as giving. You know, that's really a good quote. I, you know, I never really thought about that very much in, you know, in this context up until this point, but that's so true. And, uh, you know, God, is God concerned about our giving? Sure he is. But he's also concerned about these other areas. Earning, the, the money that we earn, the savings that we put away, the, how we spend our money, how we invest our money. They're all equally important. And uh, so if you were just thinking, well, God only cares about how much money I give in the offering plate. Well, it's true, he does, you know, he does care about that, but he cares about these other areas. And I'm reminded of a few years back when I was an assistant principal and principal of a school. That was my career. And, uh, and I, I, was, I was always in Christian education, but I used to you know, rub shoulders with public school administrators as well. So, and I, so we would be talking and I would find out how much they made a year for their salaries. It was a lot <laughs> compared to mine. And, so, and some, sometimes it was like double. And I started thinking about that in, in a wrong way, in a wrong way. And I started to get a little bit angry about it and thinking like, you know, I, I, should, make, I should make more. I should make as much as they do. You know, and the Lord really had to, had to get a hold of me and say, you know, hey, I promised you that I was going to supply all your needs. You don't need to worry about these numbers about they make twice as much as you or all that stuff. And so in time, I was able to just, okay, Lord, okay. I, I just put that thought out of my mind. If it came, I just, no, I'm not going to worry about that anymore. And I was much happier when I did it. And it's true. Uh, you know, God was, he, his, as his word said, he's, Lynn and I, we've had everything we've needed. Uh, we've been married, and all, every year, uh, God has supplied all of our needs. I don't need to worry about it. So um, salary, what we make, what we save, what we spend, all of these are concerns and they're based on biblical principles, uh, but we need to look to God first and try to do it his way. And then another thought, which I thought was good that they pointed out on this page was, and it's the second statement here, says our key question becomes, Lord, 
What do you want me to do with your money? <laughs> your money. See, it's not my money. It's God's money. Yes? Yes, I believe that my experts, my experts have really good comments on that. Would, would, would either of you guys like to field any and, and make any comments on that, Dr. McIntyre or Chuck? I'm sorry? You're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> that is excellent. I do have comments, but I want to, how about you, Chuck? Would you like to? Right, good. For if anybody was is listening to our recording, you may not have heard what what Chuck Gunder said. He he basically a summary of that would be that we don't. He doesn't think that it would be God's will for you to invest in like a casino, a gambling casino. But there, you could invest, and there is a there could every investment has some kind of could we say risk, possible risk to it. So, but if, if we're wise and we, we uh, do it according to God's principles, then I think what you're saying is that it's okay to invest money. There is actually a parable, we were gonna look at it today, about investing, the talents, the parable of the talents. We're gonna look at that in a few minutes. But uh, my own personal feeling is very uh, like what Chuck said in that, um, you know, I, and I think it's also uh, times of your life, like, when, when you're younger, like when you're 20s and 30s, I think if you do have investments that are maybe higher risk because you can earn more interest, I think that's a, a, a safe thing to do when you're younger. But when you're my age, and you know I'm, I'm this far away from actually retiring, it's not a good idea to risk, have high risk investments. And, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think conser being conservative about it. But I think Chuck's right. Every investment has some degree of risk to it. So, I, but I think we have to be careful and be good stewards of our finances. But as we'll see in the talents, just uh, not doing anything with your money, like putting it, burying it, in a, uh, putting it a hole in the ground and just letting it sit there, it's not going to earn any money. At least you could put it in the bank and make money off of it. So. I'm sorry, what? Not much. No, no, exactly, not much nowadays, that's true. Okay. So let's take a look at this, uh, this parable that we were just referring to in Matthew. If you turn to Matthew chapter 25, we're going to look at verses 14 through 30, which talks about uh, the parable, they would say, the parable of the talents. I won't read every verse, but we'll just read and, and make some general comments. Uh, in verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And verse 15, and, one, and unto one of them he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. And listen to this phrase, To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Did you notice what he said there? There were three different guys. They got three different amounts. Why? Because of their different abilities, you see? Now, and th what that says to me is that, you know, God has given me, Gary Smith, I have certain talents or abilities or 
spiritual gift or gifts that he's entrusted in me. Why? Because, of, because I'm able to handle that. Because Gary Smith is able to handle that. Now somebody else, like in this room, you might be able to handle more. Maybe, you're, maybe you, you can't handle that much. He, give, he has given each according to our ability. But what's, everyone is responsible to manage these abilities or talents um, in, a, in a proper way. So let's take a look, keep looking in this parable and see what it says. In verse 16 it says, then he that had received five talents went, what did he do? He traded with the same and made another five talents. So the guy that was given five talents, what did he do? He, he worked it and he was able to earn five more talents. And then in verse 17, and likewise he that had received two, he also gained another other two. Okay, but in verse 18, look what it says. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth. No, he made a hole in the ground. And he hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. So what happened? Well, the guy with five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou, hast, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And then the same kind of thing happened with the next guy that had two talents. Two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest to me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. The Lord responded in the same way in verse 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now let's look at the third guy. What happened? In verse 24. Then he, he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. And then verse 26. What was the Lord's reaction? Let's see. The Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. In other words, with interest. So what is this saying? It's saying that whatever we're given, whatever amount it is, one, five, two, 25, 100, a million, <laughs> We're supposed to use it. We're in our life, we're supposed to use these talents. We're supposed to use what God has given to us for his honor and glory instead of just not doing anything. There are some Christians that they have talents and abilities. They have spiritual gifts, as we talked about. They're not doing anything with it. They're not doing anything. And this parable is saying that there's, there's going to be a day of reckoning Someday, we're going, to have a get, we're going to have to give an answer to the Lord. Each of us. Gary Smith, individually, I'm going to have to give an account to the Lord for my life. What have I done? What have I done with what the Lord has given to me? And folks, you will too, you see. So, why we're still alive? <laughs> Every day is a new day. You know, okay, maybe I, maybe I blew it in the past. You know what? I can change that today. Tomorrow when I wake up, I can change that tomorrow. I can make a change, see? I can see, if I wasn't living for the Lord, I can start living for the Lord, you see? So we're going to be held accountable. There's a day of reckoning. What are we going to do with the talents that God has given to us? Well, let's, uh, moving right along there, um, let's look at this first biblical principle, ownership, God's part. What does God own according to these verses? Let's look, take a look at these verses and see quickly, what does God own? I can already tell you the answer. He owns everything. But let's just take a look. In Romans chapter 12, 
classic verse, verse 1. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, it's expected. We're supposed to. You know, we're not doing God any big favor if we, you know, we live for him and we do in our body what we should do according to his will. He's, we're not doing any great thing. It's expected. It's our reasonable service. But, but what he's saying is that, hey, I own your body. In fact, there's another verse that says, um, you are not your own, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You see? We all have a body. We're supposed to use it for God's glory. So that's one area. What does he own? He owns our body. Let's look in, in Psalm chapter 24 and verse 1. Psalm chapter 24 and verse 1. What does it say? Let's see. It says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Wow, that makes it pretty clear. God owns everything. He owns the earth. He owns the world. He owns everything that's in it. You see? He's a, and he's entrusted it to man to take care of it. Someday we're going to have to give an answer to that. Someday each person is going to have to give an account of all that. You see? So we're entrusted. But it make, he makes it clear. I own everything. You see? I own everything. And then let's look in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. I have to kind of go through that on my own when I'm trying to find a, a verse. But it's in 1 Chronicles in the Old Testament, chapter 29, verse 11. It says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? God's over everything. He's over the earth. He's over the heaven. He's over all. And he's to, he is to receive the proper respect as a result. So ownership, God's part. God owns everything. Let's look at another biblical principle, which is control, which is also God's part. Let's look at just a few scriptural names for God. These are just a few. There are many. But Almighty, he's the Almighty God. He can do anything. He's the master. He's the master. He's the shepherd. Jesus is called the Great Shepherd. He's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? God is he's sovereign. He has complete control. Uh, let's go back to 1 Chronicles again, and we'll read a few more verses in 29. We'll read verse 10 and then 12 and uh, 13. In 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10, it says, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, O blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. And then verse 12 and 13, both riches and honor come to thee, and thou reignest over all, and thine hand is powerful and might, and in thine hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. You see, God is in control of all. He's sovereign. He, he is in charge of everything. And then let's look in another verse in Psalm 135, verse 6. Psalm 135, verse 6. I told you we'd be gonna, we were going to be looking at some verses today. Psalm 135, verse 6. It says, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven, in earth, in the seas, and all deep places. You know, this, I'm, I'm sure this is referring to creation, but it's also referring to everything. 
You know, God does what he, whatever he pleases. He has no constraints. God, God can do whatever he wants to do, you see. He can do whatever he wants to do. There are no restrict. Man has no restrictions on God. He's above all of us. He's in total control. He's totally sovereign. And here's another verse to look at. It's in the book of Daniel in chapter 4. I really love this verse. Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylonia, and we've been studying Daniel. The pastor has been teaching us in the book of Daniel. Um, he came to his senses after God turned him into an animal for seven years and had him crawling around on the grass because he wa- one day walks out of his palace and looks around and goes, look at everything that I did. Look at, you know, it's because of me. <laughs> and he was actually warned before he did that by Daniel to repent of this attitude, but he did it anyway. So what did God do? Put him on the ground, crawling on his hands and hands and feet for seven years. Uh, he humbled him. He humbled him. But to Nebuchadnezzar's credit, he came to his senses and he glorified God. Listen to what he said in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 and verse 35. He says, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven and mine understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that liveth forever and ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And then verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? You see, praise the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar was given his testimony there. He came to his senses. He glorified God. He was humbled, but then he acknowledged that God is the most high God that ruleth in the hearts of men. So... You know, instead of us going through that process of being humbled, whatever way that God needs to do to us, let's just give credit to the Lord and acknowledge him and his sovereignty. I think it would save us some, uh, maybe some bad times in our life if we would do that. Okay, let's look at our next biblical principle, which is provision. And remember, this is also God's part. God has promised to meet our needs as we follow him. There are many verses about this, but the, but, the, um, but the chapter mentions a few, so I just want to look at a few. And uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Matthew 6 and verse 33. This is a great verse. I love this verse. Jesus gave this when he was given the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33... It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. Now, in some of the preceding verses, uh, some people were concerned, like, well, you know, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What, how are we going to be clothed? They were all necessities. And God said, hey, don't, don't worry about that. Instead, seek me first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. When, when I was younger, in fact, when Lynn and I first got married, I was going to Clearwater Christian College. I was working on a Bible degree. I didn't really know what God wanted me to do uh, with my life exactly. And uh, I kind of felt like I was going to go into Christian education. I knew that didn't pay a lot. <laughs> and I was wondering, like, okay, how am I gonna? How am I gonna really earn a living for us? You know, um, but then they were speaking. Someone was speaking in chapel, and they were talking about this verse. And I was ch- I was challenged that day, and I I decided I was gonna claim that verse for for our lives, for our married as Lynn and I as our married life, that we're gonna seek Him first. And you know what? I can honestly tell you, we have never had a need 
that God has them fulfilled. We have never gone without any food. If you, if you look at me, you can tell that. <laughs> but, you know, we, we've had everything that we've needed, and way more. God has just dumped blessings on us over and over again. Praise the Lord. And, and I challenge you the same, with the same verse. Seek God first, and God's going to take care of all those other things. No worries. He's promised it. He's promised it in his word. Uh, there are some other verses that, I wanna, that we want to look at, too. Uh, another one is in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. And this is also a familiar passage because it talks about Abraham and Isaac. Genesis 22, 1 through 14. And the, the uh, account is that uh, God told Abraham to take his son Isaac and uh, they were going to go up and offer a sacrifice. And uh, Isaac was, wasn't like a little, little guy. He wasn't like 10 or 12 years old. He was, a, he was a, a, an adult. And um, there wasn't any sacrifice at that point. And so listen what... Um, Listen to what Isaac says in chapter 22, Genesis 22 and verse 7. He says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Yeah. <laughs> so this is what Abraham said, verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. So what, what, what's the situation? Well, Abraham was trusting God to supply the need. And you know what? As we know from, verse, from chapter, he did. God did, of course. And look in verse 14. This is a great verse. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh. And that is to say, uh, said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it, is, it shall be seen. And in the footnote in my Bible says, the word Jehovah Jireh is Hebrew, which means the Lord will see to it, or the Lord will provide. You see? So is there a, do you have a need in your life? Look to the Lord to supply that need. Trust in him. Um, have faith, because he's promised to supply our needs. So if we have faith, yeah, it may come about in a way that you never expect it. Yeah. And maybe it's even a miracle that happens. That happens. Praise the Lord. Pray and thank God for the way that he's provided in your life. Do that every day because he, he does that all the time and we need to give him more credit. And then also in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, if we could turn there real quickly. Proverbs 29, 25, it says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. You know, God also provides safety to us, for us. And uh, I'm reminded of, a, of something that happened a number of years ago. It was over 20 years ago. Lynn was working at Clearwater Christian College. And Lynn always gets up on time, does everything right. I, I always do things wrong, but Lynn, she's always doing everything right. Well, I was working at Northside Christian, so I left earlier in the morning. So she had the alarm set, or I had the alarm set for her to wake up. The alarm went off. She could not wake up. She, would, she would just could not wake up. She kept falling back asleep, and it was so unlike her. But you know what happened? If she would have gone to work on time, there was this giant light fixture, a fluorescent light fixture, that was above the desk where she worked. At about 8 o'clock, which was about the time that she, would have, that she normally would have uh, been to work, about 8 o'clock in the morning, that big light fixture fell from the ceiling and crashed her desk. <coughs> If she had been sitting at that desk and that light fixture hit her head, I don't know what would have happened. She would have been injured or maybe worse. My point is, she was not able to wake up that morning. Why is that? I think God made her go to sleep to protect her. I do. I really do. 
you know, maybe you're driving and uh, the light changes and you have to wait and you're in, man, I'm in a hurry. I need to get to work on time or I need to, you know, maybe the Lord's trying to keep you safe. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Yeah. Maybe certain things happen and we're, we're delayed and we're like, oh, you know, I need to get there. Well, maybe you don't need to get there just now, you see. Maybe God's working things out in your life to protect you. Other circumstances, who knows? You know, God's working behind the scenes. So, um, so I'm speaking for myself. Sometimes I have a tendency to get frustrated and angry about things like that. But instead, what I should do is say, Lord, there's, there's, maybe there's a reason why this is working out. So I'm praising you for this. You know, that whatever you want to have happen or, or for your protection, you know, he's, he has a part in it. Okay, let's look at another, this is, the, this is the big part that we're responsible for, financial and faithful management. This is our part. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. It says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. We can all be faithful. You know, some people have a lot of talents, and they can take five talents, they can turn it into five more talents, or they can take five talents, they can turn it into five million talents. You know, they're talented, they got all this ability. So we're not, you know, maybe you're not as talented as somebody else. That doesn't matter. What really matters is what it says right here in verse 2, is that we're faithful. Are you, are you using what God has given to you faithfully, you see? Are you consistent? Are you faithful? That's what God requires from us, you see? So don't try to keep comparing yourself with other people. I used to do that, and I'd always be frustrated. You know, well, I'm not as, you know, I can't speak as well as they can. I can't, I, you know, comparing yourself with others is only going to lead to frustration. Instead, just be faithful to what God has given to you. And there are some really good principles here uh, that are meant, the faithfulness principle and the divided heart principle, which we'll probably have to finish up on this. If you turn to Luke chapter 16, we'll look at verses 10 through 12 quickly. Luke chapter 16, verses 10 to uh, 12, it says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. What is this verse saying? This is like a principle. This is called, the, the, the author says, it's a faithfulness principle. In other words, if you're given a, f a few things to be responsible for and you're faithful, you could get more things to be responsible for and you'll be faithful. And then the, the, the reverse of that is true also. If someone is unjust with a, with a few things, they're going to be unjust with a lot of things. You say, well, how does all that work out? Well, for instance, um, say I work at a job, and whatever job I have, I'm not doing a very good job. I'm, I'm a very bad employee. I'm not very responsible. Would it make any sense for, the, for my boss to give me a promotion and give me more responsibility? No, because I'm not being faithful in what I'm doing now. You see? <laughs> and the, the Lord, it, it, this principle applies to us in relation to the Lord. He has given us certain responsibilities, certain talents, certain gifts. Are we being responsible for it, with it? Are we, are we doing our best? If we aren't, do you think the Lord's going to give us more to be responsible for? No. Why would he? You see? But if, we're, but if we're faithful to a few things, he's going to give us more responsibility. And this, is, this can be connected with future days. Like some people think when we get to heaven, we're just going to sit around and play a harp and, I don't know, sing or something. <laughs> we're not going to do that. We're going to work. We're going to do something for the Lord. What is it going to be? I don't know. But what, whatever we're going to do, it's kind of based on what are we doing now? You see? If we're faithful in, little, in a little now on earth, someday he's going to give us more responsibility because we're faithful. 
And then the contrast, if we're not very faithful in what he's given to us now on earth, he's probably not going to give us a lot more responsibility someday in heaven. I don't know. It's, you can think about that. I've thought about it a little bit. Maybe I need to think about it more. Uh, we kind of run out of time today, but these are some principles that we need to think about with regard to finances. God controls everything. He, he's in charge of everything. He's given everything to us. He owns everything. What are we responsible for? To be good stewards. Well, let's close in a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your love to us. And pray, Lord, help us to be faithful in whatever you've given to us that we would honor and glorify you. We want to pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.